about the same time that cars were invented, airplanes were just getting started also. So it's, it's uh, pretty uh, amazing feats in technology at this time. It was December 13th, sorry, December 17th, 1903, Orville and Wilbur Wright flew their, their first plane for 12 seconds over a distance of 120 feet. Um, the Wright brothers were originally from Ohio and uh, they would travel back and forth to Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, where the winds were right. And uh, it seemed to be a, 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 it was a barrier island off the coast of, of North Carolina. And it was the perfect setting for them to um, try out their new inventions. So uh, yeah, that was 1903 when, when the Wright brothers flew their first airplane. Uh, Charles Lindbergh, a short time later, not too long, uh, a little over 20 years later, Charles Lindb Lindbergh became the first person ever to fly across the Atlantic Ocean when he did it in the spirit of St. Louis, going from New York to Paris and became a cult hero because of it and probably the most popular man in the world at the time. Um, here's a, a, a picture here of the Wright brothers' invention, uh, the plane that they used. 100 years later, uh, a mere 100 years later, a little over 100 years, you've got these type airplanes um, that have taken over. Pretty amazing. Uh, this uh, A3X, A380 uh, Airbus, um, massive airplanes uh, that originally were um, created, but then they pretty soon they fell out of favor because they were just too big and they couldn't fill up, fill them up with passengers and became pretty big issues. So you don't see too many of them around, but the capability is there. You can just see that picture right there shows you how massive that airplane is. Uh, there's Charles Lindbergh there on the left in the spirit of St. Louis, that airplane right there uh, flies above, not, not literally flies, but is hanging in the rafters at the Smithsonian Museum of uh, Aerospace, the Aerospace Museum in Washington, DC. Um, and there it is where it landed uh, in Paris. And you can see all the people that are there to meet Lindbergh. Uh, it, it becomes even more impressive when you find out that, you know, over those 20 plus hours, Lindbergh had to sit there in that seat and looking at a gas tank, basically. Um, in this day and age where we need our phones at all times, when, when wherever we're bored, we pull out our phone. He had to sit there looking at the gas tank the entire time. If you ever wanted to see in front of him, he had to put up his periscope to be able to see. They put gas tanks everywhere they could on the spirit of St. Louis so that that plane would be able to make it all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. So it was uh, the biggest, the biggest challenge for him was actually staying awake. He brought very little food, just enough for survival, enough food and water, because he didn't want to weigh, weigh down at all, um, so he wouldn't run out of gas. Another unfortunate thing that happened though, is one his association with the Nazi Party. Um, he has gone out of favor in um, in American history because of his admiration for Adolf Hitler. Um, he had a little bit of a different outlook on life. Um, he was branded as an anti anti Semite. He was uh, against Jews, so his popularity was sky high at the time. But through the years and through more um, unveiling of his beliefs, um, Americans have soured on on uh, of course on Lindbergh. Lindbergh's uh, baby was kidnapped and killed. Uh, one of the first major crimes uh, known nationwide in 1932. Um, someone, uh, they kidnapped the baby for ransom and uh, actually killed the baby. I believe it was an accident that the baby was killed, but uh, nonetheless, they were put to death for that killing when, when they found out who it was. Um, it happened in New Jersey. So the Lindbergh kidnapping was big news during that time. The consumer economy of the 1920s um, Americans, th this is the more getting into more of the modern age. Definitely post World War One, Americans were, you know, really uh, focusing on themselves. 
and making their life easier um, with things like uh, a washing machine, like a whirlpool washing machine that looks something like this, um, an electric stove and electric tools and a waffle maker here and an iron and then an, uh, a plug-in refrigerator instead of just an ice box. So things like that, you know, for really becoming the rage in the 1920s. We became definitely a, a big time consumer economy at that time. And the history is going to repeat itself in the 1950s as well. The radio was, a, was an invention uh, that, that uh, became popularized in the 1920s. In 1890, Guillermo Marconi invented what was called at the time the wireless um, and it was used for long distance communication during World War I. And then in 1920, shortly after World War I, the first ever radio station in American history in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is called KDKA. And they announced the victory of Harding over Cox. That was the first radio transmission um, in the United States from a radio uh, station. So, you know, the, the automobile was responsible for breaking families apart as as uh, kids were able to hop in a car and, and go somewhere, dad would go to work and uh, that kind of thing. The car, the, the radio brought them back together as families would sit around the radio and listen to radio shows that they loved every, every night. So, uh, much like in, in my day, we would sit around the TV as a family and watch uh, wholesome TV shows with the family. I don't know if anybody really does that anymore, but that's what we did back in my day. Uh, you know, so anyways, the radio brought families together. Film became popular also. Thomas Edison invented uh, a movie making machine in 1903. In 1903, the first uh, movie came out, motion picture, and it was called The Great Train Robbery. There was no voices in it. It was, it was not a, what they called later on a talkie. There was no, no, you had to figure out what was going on based on what they were doing. Uh, the first full length feature, long movie, was called The Birth of a Nation. Uh, and as I said earlier um, in this chapter, it glorified the KKK who saved a, a white woman who was being raped by a black man. They saved her life and it became really uh, controversial because of the glorification of the KKK. The first ever talkie, the first time there, there was talking in a movie, it was called The Jazz Singer star starring Al Jolson. What film did is it really standardized taste and culture and language throughout the country because people all over the country were watching the same thing. To you and I, it's just commonplace that when a movie comes out, it comes out all the way across the country so that if you have family or friends living in other states, they could also watch the same movie and it kind of standardized the way people dress, the way people talk, the way they act based on, you know, movies and music and that kind of thing. If in a, in the movies, you had to have the villain, right? Oftentimes look like this would oftentimes wear black because everything was black and white, right? They didn't have color at this point yet. Um, and you'd have this guy that would look sinister and he'd be the villain. Here's uh, some pictures from the great train robbery when the uh, bad guys, the robbers, one of them uh, in this picture right here, he points a gun at the audience and he fired the gun. Obviously it was a blank, but people in the movie theater, uh, the Nickelodeon they were called at the time, because you paid a nickel to get in, they were freaking out, getting underneath the seat, thinking that the bullet was gonna come out of the screen. They had no idea. There's a, the uh, picture pictures from the birth of a nation. Here's the KKK saving the woman from the African-American man who is actually white. And they put shoe, shoe polish on him because African-Americans were not allowed to uh, act in movies at this time. Same thing here. Here's Al Jolson starring in the jazz singer. And you could see the, um, you know, the, the depiction of an African-American with the oversized lips and that kind of thing that are very racist, um, very, very racist. Um, at the time, obviously they could not act. So in the movies, they were not allowed to. So that was how they were depicted. 
let's talk about women in the 1920s. They had definitely more opportunities. Um, women could now vote. Women's liberation movements were strong coming out of World War I, where women's contributions in the factories were huge and helped, uh, helped you know, really drive that victory. Uh, women who were out there and going to uh, nightclubs and dancing, and they, they were wearing provocative clothes, they were called flappers. In the 1920s, those type of women's were, women were called flappers. Uh, sex and advertising became big in the 20s, as we talked about earlier. And Sigmund Freud came out with his material. And one of the things he said was that sexual repression was responsible for most of society's ills and that pleasure and health demanded sexual gratification and liberation. So that philosophy spread and you had women that were flappers that were going out and going around town and doing things that they had never done before, like enter uh, bikini contests. And this would be like what bikinis look like in 1922. In 1928, you could see they even got a little bit shorter throughout that decade. Uh, Margaret Sanger came out and she uh, promoted birth control for women. Very controversial because one, women didn't speak out publicly. And two, for sure, if they did speak out publicly, they were not talking about sex or birth control. And uh, Margaret Sanger came out and talked about that. And she was a big, big advocate in the 1920s for birth control, saying that women should not just be barefoot and pregnant. So again, the beginning of the women's liberation movement later in the 1960s and 70s, um, it happens again. And the roots of it come back to this time. In New York, African-Americans had what they called a renaissance, not, not, not that they were calling it. No one was going around saying that were engaged in a renaissance or rebirth. But you look back in history and you see what was happening in places like New York, in Harlem, in the neighborhoods of Harlem. There was dancing, there was singing, there was acting. Um, there were poets uh, like Langston Hughes, um, authors that were uh, writing about black culture. And it was really, uh, they called it the New Negro Movement in the in uh, in the in the big cities like New York and Manhattan, uh, Marcus Garvey was the founder of the United Negro Improvement Association that promoted separation. And he he said, if we don't get what we want, if African Americans don't get what they want, they should consider moving to Africa. It was kind of a separation type movement that later would be uh, a forerunner to the Nation of Islam and the Black Panther movements, things like that. Sports, big in the 1920s. Baseball and football and uh, were two of the biggest sports at the time. So if you played football in the 1920s, um, look something like this. That was a high school field right there, that picture in, in uh, West Virginia. Um, the Oorang Indians, led by the legendary Jim Thorpe, talked about him earlier. So. Yeah, football became big in the 20s. Baseball was huge in the 20s. Ruth and Gehrig playing. Here's the gloves that they used at the time. Ebbets Field here in Brooklyn. There's a picture of Lou Gehrig and behind him, Babe Ruth. The 1927 Yankees, arguably the uh, best team in major league history. Also, uh, at the end, end of the uh, night, or just before the 20s started, the 1919 World Series, the Black Sox scandal. Uh, this is a picture of Shoeless Joe Jackson. Uh, and Shoeless Joe Jackson and seven other members of the Chicago White Sox baseball team were accused of conspiring to lose the 1919 World Series as part of a deal with gamblers. On September 28th, 1920, three players confessed and implicated the other five before a grand jury. On November 12, 1920, Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis was appointed baseball commissioner and was granted dictatorial control to restore the game's reputation. On August 2nd, 1921, a Chicago jury acquitted the players of wrongdoing, but Commissioner Landis ignored the court decision and banned Jackson and other Chicago players for, from baseball forever. So huge, huge um, black mark no pun intended there for Black Sox scandal, but on baseball and uh, was riveting for many 
many uh, years to come. Babe Ruth, probably the greatest player, arguably the be greatest player in Major League Baseball history, um, was prominent in the 1920s. He had 714 home runs, 2,213 runs batted in. And what few people know is that he started out as a pitcher and was 94 and 46. The 1920s literature, um, oftentimes the, the writers of the 1920s are called the lost generation because of their, the content of their writing. Very dark, um, very cynical, very negative. Um, people like F. Scott Fitzgerald, who wrote The Great Gatsby, Theodore Drescher in American Tragedy, Ernest Hemingway, who wrote The Sun Also Rises and Farewell to Arms, Sinclair Lewis, uh, William Faulkner, Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot were all 19s, 20s uh, writers. Um, and, and what whether it was just the cynicism of the 20s because of all the promises that were made um, from World War I or whether it was from progressivism that never reached their world, but there is a lot of cynicism in the writings of the 1920. And again, they're called the lost generation, those writers. What also was happening in the 1920s, well, and we'll get into it in the next chapter was, or two chapters from now, was Wall Street. The stock market boom, huge. Speculation was running wild. People were speculating on stocks. They were investing in stocks. They were buying what's called on margin. They were borrowing money to invest in the stock market. Imagine going, you're gonna go to Vegas, so you go take a loan out from the bank to go gamble in Vegas. We wouldn't do that. It wouldn't be smart because your chances of losing it are gonna be very high and then you're gonna have to pay that money back. A lot of people were buying on margin at the time. They were putting a little bit down for a lot of stock. They would put down say $1,000 and it would look like they purchased $10,000 in stock. Well, they have to pay that $9,000 back as long as the stock market continues to be on the rise, then that was fine. They'd make profits and then they'd pay their on margin loan back. And then whatever they made after they paid back that $9,000 was just profit. That's how they would get started. But so many people were buying stock on margin that the true value of the stocks was not known. It looked like the stock market was way up here when in reality it was way down here and it's gonna all come crashing down in October of 1929 when the stock market crashes and the world you know, goes into a frenzy. And then you, know, you, you combine that with the fact that Andrew Mellon continued to lower taxes for the rich, thinking that the money was going to, as he said, trickle down. Uh, so the rich had a lot of money and you know, Mellon wanted to see them opening factories so they could hire more people. But in fact, what the rich people are doing is they're investing in the stock market and it's driving the stock market. But if ever, anything ever goes bad, the money's all gonna disappear. And we know that's exactly what's gonna happen. So that's, uh, that's coming in the next few chapters. And that's the end of chapter 30.